Uh, we now uh, listen to the talk of Florian Grunov um, about hacking medical devices. Yeah, if you like, please okay. start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I brought some stuff to play around uh, with me, and actually, I'm, I'm, every time I bring this device anywhere, I'm gr grateful that uh, I arrive and the device arrive in a safe way, because when you're going through customs with these devices, it's always you get questions asked, and your laptop is like checked for explosives and everything like that. And I, I additionally, I tend to forget um, uh, that I have uh, all these nice little toys with me, face dancers, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and the combination of uh, plenty of cables, medical devices that have possi possibly APT in it, uh, and uh, the, the hacker tools um, most of the times um, tend to be a little bit stressful. But I made it here, so traveling from Germany to Austria is not that hard. When I was traveling to the US with the device, it was harder, uh, as you can imagine. Um, but anyways, I'm here now, um, I'm gl gr great uh, to see you, great to see so many people, that's nice. Um, I'm going to talk about the security or the insecurity of medical devices today. Um, and uh, I just been to the Medica uh, in Düsseldorf, which is a really, really great uh, big conference where all the guys that build these devices gather and show what they show off what, what they have. Um, show new devices that they build and the, um, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting that most of the vendors tend to implement uh, uh, networking capabilities and you, you actually see that some of the vendors uh, that don't know what to do with the network stack in their device just implement the network stack and then leave it there. So that was something that I, uh, I could see all over the place that when you're going to the, to the guys and ask, oh, you've got a nice patient monitor there, uh, I see that it has, it has a, a Ethernet um, uh, at the back, so what do you do with the Ethernet? What do you do with the LAN? And most of the times you get the reply, oh, well, the LAN was implemented on the board, we took the board, so it's there, we don't use it, use it actually. And this pretty much sums up uh, how these guys um, uh, think about communication in their devices and, and how they use this. Um, my name is Florian Gruno, as said. Um, I'm a security analyst for ERNW in Heidelberg. Um, most of the times I do pen testing. I'm in a team that is uh, dealing with uh, application security and I have a research project which deals obviously with medical devices. And um, I have a little bit of medical background. I, um, I've been studying, I've, I've done my bachelor in medical computer sciences. And so pen testing and medical devices with common, common enabled is really, really fun, as you will see, I hope. And um, yeah, so uh, what, I, um, what am I going to talk about today? Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the motivation that is behind this research project. Um, we uh, started the project, I think, uh, half a year ago, something like that. And it turns out that um, the project, sorry, I have a problem with my presentation here. Give me just a second. Okay, I'm back. Um, so, and it turns out that um, this field, this area of IT security is really, really interesting because you're dealing with um, uh, not only the, the classical approach of how do you disclose that stuff, how do you do that stuff, um, but you uh, really have to think, uh, uh, carefully think, how are you going to do this kind of stuff in public, okay? So we have um, research that uh, we can publish now because vendors take very, very long to implement. And I'm not going into the discussion of responsible disclosure and full disclosure here because in my sense, full disclosure is no option in this area because we are really dealing with stuff that actually can harm a patient's life. So there is no option uh, on, on, on putting pressure on two vendors. Um, I'm going to talk about publications that are uh, done before. You all have, might have heard um, the, the findings of Barnaby Jack, uh, who passed away this year, who found out uh, critical stuff in implantable cardiac defibrillators and insulin pumps. Um, there's other stuff around I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, I'm going to state you the problem because we're not 
dealing with the this, this default problems that we have in IT security when we find stuff or when we want to find stuff. Um, I'm going to show you a few targets that we looked at. One target is standing here. Um, and I'm going to disclose some of the findings that we have made so far. And at the end there will be, I hope so, there will be uh, time for questions. Okay, short disclaimer, um, all products that you see, uh, blah, 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 trademarks, property of the respective owners, because I'm going to show you a few devices and uh, they have all brands, branding on them and um, we are not associated with them and uh, they are uh, uh, the respective owner of the devices. Okay, let's start with the motivation. We have one um, core uh, slogan when it comes to IT security at ERNW, uh, ERNW, and that is make the world a safer place. And um, I think that uh, the slogan could not fit better in here than when we're dealing with medical devices. Um, the motivation behind Looking into the security or insecurity of medical devices um, is mainly, comes mainly out of its importance because we trust these devices. If you're going to a hospital and if you are really, really sick and the doctor attaches a system to you, to your body, then you will not start thinking about is this device secure, uh, is it hooked up to a network, is it patched, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah? Uh, even I don't do that, so if I would go to a hospital, I bet I would not think about if the anesthetic device uh, if is, is hooked up to a network and is it secure, is it not secure, okay, maybe. Maybe I would, but um, I think it's okay to not think about that, that kind of stuff in that moment because you're in a critical situation and, and there are other priorities than thinking about security of devices. Uh, doctors trust these devices, obviously, too. Every doctor who is using a device uh, um, is making decisions life-saving decisions um, that depend on the data that is shown on those devices. Um, and these two aspects are the most important aspects why we should look at these devices, um, why we should look at the critical infrastructure that is behind these devices. Because when we're talking about critical infrastructure, we always think about uh, um, something like, oh, can they, they uh, um, put an, an, uh, an explosion into our... Um, Kraftwerk, plant, power plant, um, uh, can they or can't? So the, the problem is that when, when it comes to medical devices, uh, these questions are really about is there a patient hooked up to a device and can I harm the patient directly? So the devices, the security of these devices has a direct impact on your health. Um, the other nice aspect is that these devices, well, not this device, but most of medical devices are really, really rocket science. Okay, think about the CTs, think about MRIs, um, the technology behind that, uh, everything, the communication systems that are used are really, really rocket science. This is really, really cool stuff to deal with, and I would love to get my hands on an MRI. Uh, I have not gotten to the point where a, a hospital would let me play with a two or three million dollar device, obviously. Obviously, it's kind of hard <laughs> to test. Um, they use proprietary protocols, which is fun all the time because when you're, especially when you're looking at patient monitoring systems and you're looking at the protocols, the proprietary protocols they are using, then you will recognize who stole from who, okay? So you see, okay, so I see this exact uh, uh, delimiter for the data is used in three different other protocols and uh, this is really, really cool uh, to look in those devices. And every device is different though. Okay, so uh, dealing with a patient monitor, you have to think of uh, different attack scenarios um, when, when it comes to harming a patient than when you're dealing with uh, a pumping system, for example, or an uh, anesthesiologist's device or something like that. Um, publications. What has been done so far? Very, very interesting is that the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, um, which is kind of the certification uh, central point in the US for um, certificating um, medical devices, put out a recommendation which says that the FDA is recommending that medical device manufacturers, blah, 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 uh, assure appropriate safeguards are in place to reduce the risk of failure due to a cyber attack. So we are living in the year 2013 and we're dealing with critical infrastructure 
And there has to be an administration or a certification authority that tells the vendors to do something about security. I couldn't believe that. And this basically sums up and shows uh, how IT security is being dealt with in the field of medical devices. Okay, we have um, Barnaby Jack, uh, who did a lot of research on medical devices, who um, managed to influence uh, uh, insulin pump to um, completely dispense the whole dose on a patient over a wireless interface, I guess it was. Um, we have uh, medical alerts that are put out uh, by um, researchers who found that they that uh, who found in a study that uh, 300 medical devices have from 40 different vendors have hard-coded passwords set maintenance passwords set which means that if you know the maintenance password you can do anything with the device that you want to do um, we have more research on implantable cardiac defibrillators, the little things that are implanted under your skin and uh, um, trigger your heart again if it comes to a rest, for example. Um, so we have studies there which, um, in which they disclosed how they uh, dealt with it, um, on what frequency the, the, the station and the defibrillator are communicating on and how the communication protocol was uh, set up. So there is research going on, um, and it turns out that some of the vendors, they can't keep up. They, they have a problem keeping up with the research that is coming in, the pressure that is applied on them, and I think this is good, because they have to deal with it. So the problem. This is the device I bought off of eBay. It cost me, I think, 20 euro. And it is an ECG, which means it measures uh, the, the, the signal transduction on your heart. Okay? And it is from the 80s. So this is an oscilloscope on the left, a real oscilloscope. I mean, like a dot that is floating around. And you have this uh, little screen on the right, which shows the pulse rate. Okay? So your heart beats with a pulse rate. And you can see that pulse rate uh, extrapolated from the ECG here. And this is an actual needle that is moving and showing you the pulse rate. So this is how uh, we built medical devices in the 80s. This is me standing in front of an EEG. Uh, an EEG is a device that measures your brain waves. You get hooked up to the device. Uh, it weighs about 200 kilos, I think, the device. It has needles, also needles, that actually uh, print the, the EEG lines on paper with ink. And this device was used, it's also from the 80s, was used in a major, major hospital in Germany uh, until, like, I think, four years or something. Okay? So hospitals are really using their stuff until it falls apart. And then they buy the new stuff. And I would say that if a hospital is now getting rid of old stuff and buying new stuff, they, will, they, they can't go around devices that have communication ports built in. Okay? The vendors tend to go to implementing maintenance port they are using. Um, they are using maintenance port that are always on, so the, the device manufacturer can always monitor the device and see if like, the temperature is too high or whatever. So this is where we're going right now. So um, hospitals have a real problem going from this, I mean hospitals in the sense of the IT, uh, the, the, the IT that is behind the hospital, going from these devices to devices that have always on communication ports to the internet or wherever, okay? So this is a big problem. So why are they doing this? Um, and why are the vendors uh, proposing uh, medical devices that have communication ports? Um, mainly because um, it, it, it has to do with optimization of processes. So imagine you got a ICU, an intensive care unit, where you have six beds. And um, to monitor those critical patients, uh, you might have to have six nurses that are uh, on the bed and uh, monitor the alarm. Um, Nowadays, this is not a scenario. No hospital would do that like this. They have one central station where you have one monitor with the, the vital signs of six of these monitors. And if an alarm pops up, if an alarm goes up, um, the nurse can go to the bed and see what's happening there. Okay? So some kind of remote control. Um, if this optimization process is good or bad, um, I will leave that to, your, to yourself. Um, 
these new communication uh, options lower the costs for hospitals, especially in Germany. There's much pressure on hospitals. Hospitals have, have to, to, to deal uh, with um, how they are investing into infrastructure, how they are investing into personnel. And um, if you can get rid of two or three nurses, then this is, might be a good decision for a hospital when uh, the device is communicating over a network and doing the stuff on its own. Uh, which is especially true in intensive care units because they are, as the name says, very intensive uh, when it comes to um, um, making uh, things work there. Uh, interoperability is an aspect too. I don't want to go into details there. Um, all the devices communicate over different protocols. Uh, you got uh, um, interfaces all over the place. You got some of them are standardized, some are not. Uh, devices tend to talk. XML, they are shifting XML files over the network, giant XML files with, with patient data. And um, as, in as the, the complexity of the protocols increases, you can imagine that the attack surface of the devices increases too. So these are devices that are used in a hospital right now. Um, they are standing on cold standby, which means that th these are anesthetic devices, which means that you have um, uh, the, the lower part, which is connected, uh, hooked up to the patient, and uh, which um, gives the, the patient oxygen during an operation. And you have devices on top of uh, these towers, I'll, I'll call it. And these are the, the monitoring, uh, this is the monitoring stuff that I have here. So this is one of the devices you could use on top of um, one of these things. Uh, these things, I guess they are 15 to 20 years old, something like that. And um, all of these devices, the monitoring systems and uh, the device below, all have network capabilities right there. Um, in this hospital, it's very interesting that uh, they, um, they didn't dare to connect the devices to the network. So they have all this fancy network connectivity, and they just don't connect it because they don't know how to deal with it. Will it harm our network? Will the network harm the devices? They, don't, they have no uh, know-how, certainly, on how to deal with, with this. So are we ready in terms of is IT in hospitals ready for this new stuff that, that is coming onto the market? Um, in German hospitals, we have uh, a lack of resources in every place, not only in IT, not only uh, considering the, uh, the, the medical day in, day out jobs. Um, which is not good, obviously, because if you're, doing, if, if you're dealing with IT security, then you have to invest, and investment is always bad. Um, you have different types of networks, so considering the lack of resources and the, the, the complication with different types of networks, you have a network for the doctors where you don't want the patients to get in. Uh, you have a network for the patients where you don't want the, the doctor to get in and the, don't want the patients to get out because they connect their Xbox 360 when they're uh, uh, on the station and, 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 and play. Um, you've got a network for the devices you got a network for guests that are coming and visiting, uh, and you might have a research net um, when you are a university hospital. So you have to deal with all these networks and have to make sure that all the data that is passing through it is going in a secure way. Um, all these semi-new technologies that are coming now in those devices, I call it semi-new because they are not new. It's, I mean, it's LAN, it's Ethernet, okay, and it's TCP IP and UDP and uh, there are some protocols on it. That's not rocket science, and that is not new. Um, but for hospitals, this might be new because, as I said, imagine that you are IT in a hospital, and uh, somebody comes up to you and says, OK, we have this EEG from the 80s. We will get rid of it, and this is the new EEG we bought, and it has network capability, and I want to see in my room uh, how the patient is, and uh, please make this work. Okay, So this is completely new for IT in hospitals. And we have the aspect of remote maintenance, um, which is a problem too, because uh, vendors really, really tend to push out the devices, hook them up to the network, and then connect from remote to every device and see if everything um, plays out well. Especially the, the higher class vendors do this um, nowadays. I think that you can't even buy a, a, a one of the new devices without this option. This is non optional. Are we ready in terms of, are you as patients ready? 
what about home monitoring? Think about home monitoring, ambient assisted living, stuff like that. Um, devices that we, we get uh, from our doctors, ECGs that we carry around all the time to, to monitor 24 seven our heart rate, um, stuff like that connects to the internet, uh, uses your internet connection, uploads data. Um, there are ICDs, implantable cardiac defibrillators that have a base station that is connected to your wireless network. And the doctor can view the data of the ICD and the ICD is sending wirelessly data to the space station to the doctor. And this opens up scenarios that are really, really frightening in my, my idea. So um, one major aspect is, that, and we see this with Wi-Fi, okay? So Wi-Fi has to integrate uh, flawlessly. My mother doesn't want to set up a 42 uh, char uh, WPA2 key. Yeah? She just wants to let the device there, stand there, uh, push a button and everything's fine. And this will be the same, I think, with uh, devices that are used for personal health. They have to be usable and they have to be usable for old people, okay? Um, yeah. So what about the vendors? The vendors? Um, my impression is that um, vendors do the same mistakes again that we all go through all over the time a new technology arises. Okay? Think about Wi-Fi. We had gone through the pain of Wi-Fi, of having a decent Wi-Fi encryption. It took us 15 years <laughs> nearly to get an a, a encryption that really, really w seems to work right now. Think about car keys. When the first wireless car keys came up, replay attacks were all over the place. Vendors had to patch. Vendors had to think about new uh, stuff. And this Dealing with medical devices and security is a bit to me like exploiting, in the, uh, exploiting stuff like in the old days, okay? You have all those stuff like unencrypted communication, uh, uh, you have ports open with admin interfaces, listening with no passwords and stuff like that all over the place. And I, I said that um, the vendors are not really uh, uh, sensible about that kind of stuff. Um, they implement stuff that they are not using, even if it has network capability or whatever. Um, they might use it later, and then they will think about the security of the devices. Um, I got hands on a device of a vendor that um, wanted the, the patient monitor in the operation room to be visible by, via a web browser uh, in the doctor's office. So imagine a patient monitor with a web server listening for incoming requests. So we got all this kind of nice uh, web exploitation stuff coming again and again. Um, they are dealing with it because they are having two network interfaces into the machine. One is trusted, one is not trusted. Uh, it's running an embedded Windows XP. So I guess that when you're owning something over the untrusted network, which might happen, you will never have a chance to get into the trusted network, I bet. Yeah? So there might, this, is, this is really, really good to have physically two network interfaces that are on the same box, basically. Okay. Um, when we're talking about compliance, when you build a device, you need to be compliant in some kind of way. We, in, in Germany, we have the Medizinproduktegesetz. The FDA pulls out uh, certification processes as well. Um, in Europe, we have some, some guidelines uh, that we have to follow. And um, what is really, really interesting is that all these guidelines, everything that you need to do to put out a device onto the market, focus on safety and not on security, which is in the first place, okay, because if I get hooked up to this device, I want it to be safe first. I don't want to get electric shocks. Uh, I don't want uh, something to happen, what should not happen. Um, but the thing is that um, when you talk to vendors about safety and security, they don't even know what safety is and what security is. So if you go up to the vendor and say, um, okay, we need to talk about the security of your device, they all think like, yeah, well, that's no problem. We, we uh, um, have like the circuits board, they are separated and nothing can happen to the patient. And this is especially a problem in Germany or in Austria because we don't have the word security and safety. So if we are communicating, we are communicating via the word Sicherheit. There might be the word Datensicherheit, uh, okay, so you could distinguish that, but who does that, okay? If I go up to a guy and say, like, we're, we're going to talk about uh, Sicherheit now, then nobody knows, is it safety, is it security, is it both, what are you talking about? And the medical device vendors tend to focus on safety totally. Um, safety mostly works, though, 
uh, to say something good, but they still have bugs like, um, ah, okay, um, the device is showing an, uh, showing an asystole alarm even if the patient is fine. And asystole is like a flat line, which means that your heart stop beating, okay? So there are high-end patient monitors out there that are stuffed with features, stuffed full of, of, of features that have bugs like the, the, the alarm suddenly goes off and tells like the patient is dead, okay? So, and this is kind of scary because you see that even in the safety aspect, they, they can't control the, the, um, the features that they implement. Okay, so more features means more attack surface, and that means more attack surface for safety and security. Um, in Germany, if you want to put out a software that is used in, the, in, medical, in a medical device or in a hospital, um, then basically what you need to do to prove that the software is secure is uh, you need to have a proper authorization mechanism. Okay, so you need to make sure that the nurse is not in God mode and that the doctor is and that's it, basically, okay? So if you talk to the vendors, okay, what do you do to implement security in your software? Authorization, that's it, because there are hackers out there, and if there are hackers out there, a hacker will anytime find a way into the system, so there is no chance to make it secure. In the US, when you need to put out a device, you need to fill out a form, and in this form you need to state um, what the device does, and uh, if there are devices out there that are similar which shortens the process of getting a device out onto the market. And um, one of these forms is called 510K. And most of the vendors, when they push out the product on the market, they say that um, our 510K assumes that there is no hostile environment, the doctor will not harm the patient, and the patient will not harm the doctor or himself. Bam, that's it. There are no security considerations that Florian might come into the, the, into the hospital and harm the doctor. Uh, so there is no hostile environment, everything's fine, the world is a happy place. And certification also does not focus on security or has no focus on security but on, on safety. Okay, so uh, I will do up a little summary here. Um, we have little resources on the customer side, the customer is the hospital. We have little experience with incidents because this technology is new for the vendors and for the hospitals. Um, so we even don't know if, how they react. So uh, if I go up to somebody and tell them, okay, there is a remote root exploit on your device, I found it, I can manipulate the data on it, and I can show whatever I want, um, then it depends on how are they going to react. Do they have a process for this even? I mean, if they can't distinguish between safety and security, do they have a security process, a, a patch process uh, for putting out patches? They, they even can't possibly patch because if I buy this device and put it up to my hospital and it stands there and I disconnect it from the wireless and disconnect it from the LAN, um, how am I going to reach my customer? How am I going to reach my customer and tell him, hey, there's a security vulnerability in there Pro probably every month and tell him we need to patch again. This is not feasible, okay? So it's, it's really, really difficult uh, to apply patches in a hospital. And we have this safety versus security. We don't speak the same language. So we security researchers do not speak the same language as the vendors do. And this could probably kill you. Okay, we're going into some of the targets that uh, we will be looking at, and this is something for you too, so if you are going out, uh, uh, if you're paying your doctor a visit and uh, you see that he has some devices with network connectivity, just you know, leave the room with it, uh, get, get, or, or uh, let the doctor get out and, and get your hands on it because it's really, really important, I think, that we as the research community, as the hacker community, um, go on these devices, put our hands on these devices and show that where the problems are because we are not talking about critical infrastructure that costs a lot. We are talking about critical infrastructure that could cost lives, okay? So, um, Obviously, we are looking at devices with enabled communication, and enabled communication is all over the place. I have seen prosthetic limbs that have Bluetooth enabled. I don't know why, but they, they are putting prosthetic limbs out there that you can, you, obviously you can't control them with your, with your iPad, but, um, but you can see if, every, if, if the settings of the, the prosthetic limb is uh, still in place and everything works out fine, so you can fine tune, okay? Um, so nobody would suspect communication in there. 
Um, you could do a severity rating uh, if you wanted to. You could say that uh, devices with a, with a low impact are devices that are just monitoring stuff, which is critical enough because when you're monitoring stuff, uh, your decisions will depend on the data that you are monitoring, right? Um, medium would be diagnostic systems like MRIs or uh, X-ray machines or something like that. Uh, a misconfiguration of an X-ray machine may harm the patient too, and a misconfiguration of an MRI may cost the hospital three, four, five million, because if this device fails and, and, and needs to be replaced, then this is really, really expensive. And the, the category with the, with the highest severity rating would be anything that has feedback to a patient. Think about medical pumping systems. Think about ICDs, implantable cardiac defibrillators. Uh, think about anesthesia machines um, and stuff like that. So in the monitoring world, we have um, uh, stuff like this. Basically, uh, all these machines uh, can do the same as this machine here. This is a little bit cheaper, though. Um, as these machines, so you can buy a patient monitor from $750 up to $30,000. So this is the range that you can, can have. And you can imagine that the features increase with the price. You have diagnostic systems like this, MRI on the left, an X-ray machine on the right. Every, um, even the old MRIs are communicating over the network because they are pushing their images into a central server where the doctor can view the data on his workstation, okay? So you are, if you're getting um, um, put in here, uh, the pictures will be transmitted uh, over SMB possibly uh, to a network share, and on this network share, which is the simplest case, and on the network share, the, the doctor has the possibility to view the, um, to view the data. So even old MRIs, CTs, whatever, have networking capabilities. And then we have everything that has feedback to a, um, to a patient, implantable cardiac defibrillators like these. Um, they have, the new uh, ones have uh, two different kind of communication protocols. One is inductive, which means that you have to put the programmer onto the patient and uh, via a mechanism similar to RFID, uh, the programmer and the device can communicate. But you can enable a, an additional communication port on these devices, which has a range of 10, 15, 20 meters, and which is uh, capable um, of transmitting data to. Then you have, uh, the anesthesiologist device and medical pumping systems like this. If you're on an intensive care unit and you need to get uh, medical um, medication, like four, five, six different medications, then something like this will be hooked up to your bed and uh, will be attached to you. And this is also uh, controllable over the network, okay? What could possibly go wrong? Okay, targets. Um, it's very, very hard. If you plan to start doing something like this, it's very, very hard to get your hands on these devices because either they are really, really expensive or you are not allowed to operate them. I am not allowed to have an X-ray machine in my basement, okay? And I could not convince my boss to have an MRI scanner in our basement at the office. So this is a problem. Um, you need uh, to, to focus First of all, to start with something you get your, can get your hands on. There's a nice website I can recommend. Um, I'm not affiliated with it, MedWow. MedWow.com, I think it is. And you can buy everything there. You can buy mobile MRIs. So you get like a truck, and in this truck is a mobile MRI. I think it costs about one million. So um, you can get everything on there. Everything used, uh, uh, still functional. Okay, um, they are expensive. Um, vendors have little interest to cooperate, so most of the times we are going to the vendors and telling them, okay, you're going to put up a new device, uh, we know that, it has communication ports, don't you want to let us take a look at it and uh, we tell you if uh, we think that it's okay to use it in a network or not. Um, they um, most of the times block or are not interested. What is interesting is that vendors that do have an issue like a patient has been harmed by an exploding patient monitor, something like that, um, then they are interested. So you see that there is no sensibilization in this field, okay? So vendors, uh, we are going to the same pain all over again. We need to, uh, to, to go through the pain, the vendors have to go through the pain of losing something, of breaking something, um, to make them see that they have to invest in security. 
And if you're going into corporations like we do, we're going into corporations with hospitals uh, because they want to know if their devices are secure or not, then you have to deal with uh, liability, okay? So if I crash the MRI and it doesn't come up, who is going to pay for it, all right? So this is our interesting questions that you have to answer before you start hacking on those devices. So they are hard to test. Okay, um, I'm going through three case studies, short case studies, that we have done um, on devices where we had our hands on. The first example is to just to give you an impression how um, networking capabilities are used in this field, in the low cost field of EEGs, um, this example. An EEG measures brain waves, as I told you, and this uh, case um, this product is used in small and medium-sized uh, medical offices. It's basically a gray box, and it has a computer, a normal workstation with the software on it. And both of them are hooked up over LAN, and they communicate over UDP. So the software is sending UDP packets to control the box, and the box is sending the data back via a UDP uh, stream too. Okay? So there is no authentication, no encryption, no security implemented whatsoever. They just throw UDP packets at each other and hope that they arrive. And um, this is all they do. So if you reverse engineer the protocol that is used, you have full control of the gray box. I'm going to show you a small video, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So this is the box. Uh, these things up here obfuscate the vendor name. And what you see is these are the buttons for the electrodes. So the electrode, electrodes get hooked up to your head and then go into the box. The box is connected via um, a network to the workstation. And what you see up here are um, LEDs that show the doctor which kind of setting they actually have on the EEG. So you can uh, hook up the patient and say like, okay, I want to have uh, this electrode and this electrode, or I want to have this electrode and this electrode, and this depends on what the doctor is going to measure, okay? So what the diagnosis uh, would be. So this shows how the setting is made. Okay, so this is the device. Then you see that this is the software to it. Um, you see that this is raw data because no patient is hooked up. And what you see is the same uh, thing up here in the right that you saw on the box, which means that if I would take a setting that connects like the outer electrodes with, with each other, um, then I would see a yellow uh, um, thing here and it, it will be connected. What I do now is in during, so I'm sending packets, the device is sending packets over the network and the control station is sending um, net, um, packets over the network too. So what I do is simply uh, sending packets by myself now and we are going back to the software and you see that the software is not responding, you see that there are no uh, connections made here, it's still the same thing, data is coming from the device, nothing happens, the doctor seems everything is fine. And what you see on the device is that I have full control over the LEDs and I can hard uh, uh, tell the LEDs what to do and, and what uh, not to do. So this might not be a problem at first glance, okay? Because um, you're not really harming the patient with that. What you could do is that you could connect uh, electrodes uh, different than the doctor uh, used to configure them, which might lead to different results, which might lead the, to a diagnosis that will get you into a hospital or whatever. But uh, this is not something that um, um, is, is really, really painful or something like that. You can even build EEGs on your own. This is just a uh, short break I will do. Uh, there is a, a crazy um, project, Open EEG. It's called Open EEG. It's under the GPL. You can build your own EEG. We did that. Uh, you see the, the, the box with the red button there, and you can hook up a patient, and this patient is able to play games via brainwaves on a computer. So this is also uh, some kind of, of nice side effect when you're dealing with uh, computers and with uh, medical stuff. So um, take a look at that project. It's really worth a shot. Okay, we're coming to the next two parts. Um, I will not tell you any details on how I... Um, do the stuff I'm going to do on this device right here, okay? And I'm not going to tell you uh, who the vendor is. 
That is because the disclosure process is still a process. We have not gotten to the point where the vendor says, yay, thank you, everything's fine. And as we might be able to harm patients with that, I'm not going to disclose any details. Sorry, there will not be any GitHub tools or whatever. Um, okay, patient monitors. Widely used in, in hospitals, intensive care units, during an operation. Um, I think you might have gotten the point uh, how to use them. Um, they monitor critical vital signs like the oxygen saturation in your blood, ECG, blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. What I um, brought you is um, the measurement of uh, the um, oxygen level in my blood. Normally I would hook up uh, someone from the audience, but you're too far away, so you're lucky. Um, so I have to hook up myself. And you should see that there are some waves on it. Okay. Um, so this is the normal configuration of a patient monitor. So the first thing I want to show you is um, it's just a picture, and it's a picture of a device that we managed to reconfigure. We managed to reconfigure the alarm boundaries of the device, which is a total fail if you can manipulate the, the alarm boundaries over the network because you can basically tell the device, okay, let's say like pulse rate, let's take pulse rate, okay? If your pulse rate is zero, then the heart's not beating and obviously you're dead, okay? Simple. So what would happen if we could manage to set alarm boundaries for the pulse rate uh, that are so far away from anything uh, that, that works that you, an alarm would never be triggered. So we made this. We put up a configuration for the pulse rate with 30,000, more than 30,000, and which goes up minus 30,000, okay? And if you die with this machine hooked up, nobody will recognize, okay? So this will just go on and tell everything's fine, everything's fine, get along, nothing to see, everything's fine, okay? Um, we have more on this device. We can uh, basically also nuke it out of the network, which is also not good. If you're hooked up and, the, and you're like a doctor in the middle of a resuscitation and you're looking at the device and it just reboots because somebody's sending a magic packet over the network, uh, this can be good also, okay? Okay. So this is the first device we've looked, looked at. Um, this is some kind of high-class vendor, okay? So this is nothing cheap. And it's... For, uh, it's intention the, the picture is intentionally like this, so you cannot, uh, I hope, that you cannot find out uh, who it is. Okay, target two, standing in front of you. This is the second patient monitor that we're looking at. It has two central elements. It has two arm boards. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm not good in time. You see two arm boards on there. One is for the signal processing on the left side, and one is basically the front end uh, on the right side um, in the machine. Okay. Mm, yeah. So, first of all, I am going to start a software. And this software is able to display in real time the data from this device. Okay, so I'm hooked up with my laptop um, with this device over the network. If I connect myself, then I should see something red going on in the lower part of the screen. Come on, okay. Uh, so this is uh, basically um, my pulse, which is quite high, and, um, <laughs> and uh, my oxygen saturation, which is 97. Okay, so. Um, so we have, this is the classic setup. We have a central station. We can monitor the device. The device is displaying data. What would we do if we would if we are a three-letter secret agency and want to kill the patient and nobody to recognize at night, what is the first thing? Replay attack. Replay attack. OK. So we want to kill the patient and actually have live data on the central monitoring station so everything's fine. OK. We need to get into the middle of this device and the central monitoring station. Um, so this is a live feed from the webcam you see here. Uh, first of all, I'm going to, uh, no, I'm not going to do this. Um, I'm going to hook myself up so that you see that the device is displaying something. Come on, come on, come on, faster. Uh, 
Okay, I'm there. So, um, I'm basically, I'm nuking the device off the network, so you see it's not moving anymore, right? Okay? So I'm playing a classic denial of service on the device. So now it gets complicated because I have this finger here and I have to use, okay? Uh, and you see that um, here is no data coming, right? We had some data coming live in there. No data anymore. The, the, um, the box is pretty much broken right now. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fake data in the central station, which has nothing to do with anything that, that is happening here. So I can put, I'm dead now. This is the point where I'm dead. And you are sitting at the central station and see that the monitor still is connected. And I even got more data than before, okay? So <laughs> somebody, somebody hooked up the patient. Okay, so I can, stop my denial of service and the device comes back to life. It's there, it shows the flat line. The patient is dead now, going back to the central station, patient still alive, everything's fine. Okay, so this is the one part. The second part is I don't want to manipulate only the central station, I also want to manipulate the data that is on here, okay? So I want to, come back to me again. I think I'm over time, but I'm doing, oh no, I'm not perfect. Time, two minutes, plenty. Okay, um, so I'm hooked up here, data is fine, everything's fine, I'm alive, and um, what I'm going to do now is I'm... Uh, I'm failing hard on the last demo. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to do this manually. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I want live data and I'm going to record what I see on the screen basically. So um, I've used my exploit to gain access to the device. Okay, so I'm recording stuff now on the device. Okay, record is through. Now, the point again where I get shot or whatever, I'm, I'm dead now, flat line. What happens now is the screen will blank, so you see that I am manipulating the device, and hopefully the screen will come back and display data. Come on, yay, I'm there again. Okay, um, so, um, okay, so the next thing I could do is um, basically wait for the device to rickroll me. I can play videos on the device, isn't that neat? <laughs> Yeah, so this is complete root compromise. I have root on the box and I can do whatever I want. I can display you whatever I want. Okay, let's sum that up and stop that shitty software. So, okay. So, to sum that up a little bit, there's more to come. It is really, really, really a stressful process in getting hands on these devices. If you want to join us, if you want to uh, um, uh, test devices, get your hands dirty, get your hands on it. Um, the corporations that we have with hospitals are really, really uh, have promising uh, results. We have seen anesthetic machines that have NT4 as an, o o um, as an, an operating system on them. Um, and there's enabled COM all over the place. Nobody's thinking about security right now. And I think we should change something like, uh, like this situation. So we need to test these devices. Remember that responsible disclosure really, really is critical in this part. Get your hands dirty and uh, wait for new publications. Stay tuned. Questions? Yeah. So, um, hello. Yeah. So we've learned over the last 
five or six years that responsible disclosure for software companies takes upwards of two years, depending on yeah. how bad HP are. Yeah. Um, how long is a responsible disclosure for a product that realistically will probably never be updated? Yeah. The, the thing is that you should draw a line somewhere, okay? So you can't, um, it, it depends on the situation, I would say. If you have a medical device that has direct impact on the patient's health, like a medical pump or an ICD or whatever, then you would probably invest more waiting time in hoping they fix it and try to apply more pressure um, in terms of making publications that do not name the vendor but do generally show the concept, for example. You, can, you need to do this on, on, so the decision must be made on, um, in terms of what is the device and how harmful is it? And how, uh, what is the attack, okay? So if you got a warmable attack like this one would be warmable, right? Uh, you can automate this attack. Um, then you should step back a little bit and give more time to fix, all right? So this is really, really, really uh, not easy. How difficult is to analyze and debug these devices? I mean, do you have to resort to hardware debugging, JTAG, or it's more? Sometimes, yes, it depends. As I said, the devices are really, really uh, different. Um, sometimes they are using just an, an, an embedded system with Linux on it, so you can get your hands dirty there pretty, pretty easily. Um, but sometimes they implement their own kernel, their own schedulers, their own processes, and this gets harder. So you have to do a lot of research and a lot of reverse engineering uh, to understand how the device works. Yep, thanks. So. So thank you, for Florian, and now we continue with uh, Stefan Fiebeck's talk. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you.